Uh, Bashar, thank you so much for joining me on Bollywood Film Fame. We are hoping to bring to light the stories of directors, of people who work behind the scenes, because the limelight is so often shone on the actors and the people in front of the screen that we oftentimes don't realize the hard work uh, that goes into actually making a film. Uh, yes. Congratulations on Saving Chintu. Thank you. It's a wonderfully apt film. Uh, the reason for it is because the things that we're dealing with today on a global level, uh, whether it be stigmas attached to HIV, AIDS, and that stigma has been attached for a very, very long period of time. And of course, also homosexuality and generally speaking, dealing with the LGBT community, the fact that we still have to say that we're, we have to deal with these issues uh, and say that these are issues, I put that in quotes, uh, is, is ridiculous in some way, shape or form. Of course, Saving Jintu sort of looks at both perspectives and puts it into one lens. Tell me a little bit about, first of all, what inspired you to make this film? So I uh, was working on this script. I was working since 2017. And this is a film uh, inspired by true events in a way that this is a story of my doctor from LA. Mm. And one day we just, uh, you know, he is my doctor and we randomly met uh, and his wife uh, was with him and we met for a dinner. And they were just talking and she was like, why don't you tell him he, he's a filmmaker and I, I think your story needs to be out there. And he didn't seem very comfortable with the idea. And so anyhow, he ended up sharing the story with me and I loved it. And we signed uh, like 24 pages NDA where he was like that my name or my parents name should not come out because he was aware that what his parents did was out of love, but he at the same time wants to, you know, kind of safeguard his parents because he understands what they did was not, you know, fully into the legalities of mm. any of the countries. But the problem was, so I sat with this trip since 2017 to 2018. 18th uh, September because uh, in his uh, story the parents were uh, straight okay. so I what happened was like I was trying to I, I love the story but there was not enough you know uh, stakes to make it a kind of you know just uh, all the like I wanted to put a lot of hurdles and everything but you know if you kind of a write script where a straight couple comes to India and they have, they had different uh, problems, which were like very minimal problems. I was like, we have seen that. So I was sitting with this script. I was like, something will come along that would kind of give that a nudge, a kick that it will just so to collaborate with, you know, inspired by true events, but this adds and makes it complete. So what happened when I uh, moved to India for a couple of years in uh, August, 2018. So I've lived in, like I've lived in New York, I've lived in uh, LA, and then I was moving from Atlanta. So I wanted to kind of detox from, you know, so to say Americanness that I was living in for like almost eight, nine years. So I went to this ashram in Rishikesh and it, the, it changed my life. So what happened was, uh, you know, uh, the, the part of the ashram was that they used to wake up, us up at like 5 a.m. and uh, we used to do yoga and meditation and stuff like that. And after that, uh, like around 7.30 to 8, there would be group sessions where you used, you used to have like discussions or, and spiritual uh, exchange and everything. So very second day, we were like uh, just being introduced to each other. And there was this guy called Jeremy. Mm -hmm. He was in the group and a lot of other people were in the group. So I was like, I'm filmmaker. I've just moved from uh, Atlanta to India and stuff like that. And when... It was his turn. He gave the introduction that captured my interest. He just said that I'm uh, Jeremy, I'm uh, American, and uh, I'm f originally from New York, but I've been living in India for almost 15 years, mm -hmm. and I run a shelter for kids. Okay. 
and that grabbed my attention and uh, we spoke after the session and i just wanted to know a little bit more about what type of shelter is he running and he uh, told me the story which touched my like soul and i was on goosebumps and i'll just share quickly uh, bits and pieces so he told me that he came to india for the first time in 2000 and he took the spiritual uh, kind of uh, you know just to get away trip because at that time he was diagnosed with hiv so he was having oh. a turmoil in his life so he decided to just get away from him his regular regular life and come to a country where he has never visited and then he somehow happened in uh, ended up in nagpur and he saw uh, how kids with hiv or aids at the time were treated so he decided to sell everything he had back in new york he bought a building here and he started running shelter and obviously my next question was you know coming from america just you know settling yourself in india where there is so much stigma around hiv mm-hmm. what was his experience what was his hurdle and he told me i'll quickly tell you two stories uh, that was just heartbreaking he told me that uh, you know for so long he was teaching his kids uh, uh through you know social help like social worker and stuff like that so he was like my uh, this uh, shelter used to be in nagpur main city for so long the goons were trying to chase him away from the main city saying that he's breeding and feeding virus until they physically heard one of the kid from his shelter and he left the building uh in like a week's time after four three or four years years of being in there and he moved to the uh, i think 50 kilometers away from the city and he was like for next two years i was uh, you know taking help of social uh, workers and i was teaching the kids myself and stuff like that and he was like two years back like two years from last year last to last year sorry in 2018 he was like i went to a school which is like uh, just 2 kilometers away from uh, where he was living so it's like mm-hmm. way far away from the main city so he was like not a lot of kids from the main city they come to that school so he was like i decided that i want to get all 30 kids that he at the time uh, was uh, taking care of to get admission in proper school and he was like i went to the school um uh, i the uh, you know the uh, principal took admission of all the kids and when she was filling out the form so she was asking his name so he was like i just gave them my business card so that it could be easier for them to just fill it out the moment she saw hiv logo on his card and she asked him what does he do and he 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 had already told him that mm-hmm, he takes mm-hmm. care of kids and she was like are these those kids and he was like yes and she canceled the admission wow so now here is the point where i can tell the same story and i can make the parents from a community where it 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 makes it it uh, sorry it makes it much more harder for them to come to india and uh, you know adopt a child and now we are dealing with issues that uh, somebody has dealt with somebody has been dealing with so yeah that was the whole inspiration wow that's heavy it's interesting because you took you, you sort of took two two sort of distinct worlds and two sort of distinct stories and amalgamated them into one it's an interesting uh narrative in the sense that what we see is one a homosexual couple who is traveling to India for adoption and they're not caricaturish which is important because uh, hindi cinema generally speaking especially in the feature film spectrum yeah. has always depicted and i i would say in 99.9% of the films that even have a homosexual and identified homosexual uh in the film somebody who identifies like that uh in a very caricaturish form number 1 and number 2 if they show a relationship between two homosexual individuals 
that relationship is very watered down, number one. And number two, it tends not to show the human side of that relationship in the sense that the two of them can actually have conflicts. The two yes. of them can actually have insecurities that the couple may be going through some ups and downs on a personal level as well. Was that intentional on your part to make sure that you show that this is a couple and just like a straight couple, they also have insecurities. They also have issues in their own relationships. Was that a conscious decision on your end? That was a very con conscious decision because what happened like over the time I have been to film festival, I've seen film festival and uh, you know, some of the film festival, they specifically have LGBTQ uh, category and some of them, they, uh, you know, it comes under drama. So, so many films, almost like I would say 90% of the LGBTQ films I've seen, they deal with, uh, you know, drug addiction, they deal with uh, sex, sex addiction, they deal with other issues, which, you know, is kind of, now it's kind of a stereotypical for LGBTQ people. And here I thought that the first problem is that we, in 2020, even still in like 21st century, we need to start a conversation first to normalize it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's not just it's not normal just yet. So I wanted. So how I pitch the film to producers and everybody else is like it's it's about a non-traditional couple who, which comes to India to adopt this kid who's living. So, so many people used who's suffering with HIV. I was like, it, it's not suffering, it's living with HIV. We need, so the one thing is like, we need to change the terms that we are using because it makes much more difference. So then I pitched like, uh, you know, the, the kid who's living with HIV in an Indian orphanage. And this couple happens to be a gay couple. It's not about, I never was like, I just want to normalize it in a way that, you know, a gay couple can be as good parents as straight couple and you know it's 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 this film is it's mostly on emotional level on deep level it's like that's why there were so many uh, you know instances when i co-wrote with uh, two other filmmakers two other writers and we were discussing like should this have a kiss or just a little bit of a kiss or any you know bare chested scene or any scene where they're just laying in bed or waking up i was like no i want to make this film in a way where they don't even they they end up touching each other like once or twice in in a film it's emotionally driven film i understand that if somebody touches someone else it's it it's kind of an electric charge exchange and it makes you feel things and it makes you you know uh, it just kind of charges up your body in a different way in this film i wanted to make sure same thing has happened through dialogue through emotion and yeah i mean it's just normalizing the the whole narrative of you know uh, uh, LGBTQ couple and straight couple. How about a couple? How about parents? Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. So that was like a con conscious decision. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes I look at a short film, and one, it has great potential. Short films these days because the attention span of a viewer is so much more minimal than it used to be in the 90s when we used to be able to watch a feature film that was three hours long. It was very normal to yeah. watch that. Of course, yeah. with the advent of technology and the fact that we have so much more content available at our fingertips, our attention spans have gotten shorter. However, when I was watching the film and when it ended, it's a 24 minute or so film, I believe it is. Yes. And I was watching and I thought, this has the potential to be a feature length a feature film. Why did you go the short film route? Was that just a, that this is how you imagined it? Or was it a feature film and then you decided, no, I think this should be a short film instead. What was the driving factor? So this actually, uh, you, you said it right. It has a potential of feature film. It did uh, came uh, to my like, you know, conscience as a feature film. But then I was like, then it's always about getting, uh, you know, the funding and getting the right, right. Uh, executive producer and stuff like that. So I thought, 
how about if you are able to you know kind of sum it up 90 minutes or 120 minutes into 24 minutes and still make it a quality short film and be able to get into big film festivals so it actually is my it works uh, as a proof of concept whenever i want to uh, make a feature so i don't have to like ask executive producers like can you read the script like mm -hmm. without seeing anything or uh, to have them look at you know storyboards and stuff like that i can that's all secondary as like i want to make a feature uh, it's uh, you know here's a proof of concept can you see watch uh, can you watch 24 minutes proof of concept and it's much more easier to you know capture someone's attention with a visual storytelling instead of re having them read script or having them go through you know storyboards so i i thought it might and it, it's been working i actually got offered a feature mm. uh not this uh very specific story but i got offered a feature of after like the, the, the known uh indian uh, executive producer and producer they uh, saw my film and they were like how about would you like to do a feature film and stuff like that I was like I would love to so yeah, this is how uh, you know this short films are like tools these days one has to be I say to uh, this to independent filmmakers fellow filmmakers you know this is the time where everybody even audience are like so smart so these days we need to be uh, smart filmmakers not just filmmakers we have to be mm -hmm. aware filmmakers and we should treat short films like a tool at our disposal so yeah saving you is a very interesting title and i think that is subject to the viewer's interpretation i mean i want to know what your interpretation is because my interpretation may be slightly different than yours uh, tell yes. me why Savings into the time that you chose in your interpretation. So my all the short films that I've done in past, I have just named them my leads uh, characters' name. So I was going for Chintu. So Corey Wright, who is co-writer on the film, he uh, I sent him a draft, and he was supposed to put it so he's he's american writer so i made sure that i engage one american writer because things have to fall in place from the perspective of american people as well so he sends me a draft and he renamed it to saving chintu and mm -hmm. i want uh, we had this conversation because through the perspective through the narrative in first half of the film is saving Chintu, as in like they're going there to save Chintu until, uh, you know, uh, the Oliver is made aware of the circumstances. Mm. It's just, you know, puts you into uh, the, uh, the whole journey that you're going to save uh, this little kid and comes up that first you have to save your relationship and then you can do anything else mm. beyond. So, yeah. But I would like to know your perspective as well. So it, it was interesting to me because when I first started watching it, I thought that it had to do with saving to do in the sense that he has AIDS and we're trying to get him out of the situation. But as 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 the movie progressed, I thought to myself, it's it's almost as though in order to save Chindu, they they sort of have to work on themselves. It's not just yes. and it's it's this very um, there's a theory about it, and I don't know exactly what the theory is called, but it's it's the superiority uh, that people in North America tend to have when they travel to countries like India, which is deemed, uh, and I put this in quotes, a third world country, third world. which I don't think it is. Uh, but it's, it's the superiority complex where, you know, we are the saviors, we're going to come save you. And then when they get there, it, they realize that there's some internal work that they have to do. To yeah, themselves. yeah. So that was my interpretation of it. The, the towel scene, it's, it's funny because as a South Asian who lives in North America, it's funny how much those kind of conversations really irk me. You know, I, I don't live in India at all, but, you know, those little comments that I just look at them and I think to myself, like, really? <laughs> like did you just ask yeah. me that question? <laughs> so it's interesting that it made its way into your narrative, which, again, is very important. And I think it plays a huge part in the way I interpreted the title Saving Chintu. 
So Sharon, what's next for you? Now, you know, you've talked about short films being a tool uh, for potential feature films, but what is next for you, do you think? I mean, I know we're living in uncertain times and it's COVID-19 and shoots are going to be heavily regulated if and when shooting in India is even allowed uh, and shooting on a wide scale is going to be very problematic for the next, at least foreseeable future anyway. So what's next for you? So I'm actually working on a feature and I, so I'm someone like I have done a feature in Atlanta, which is yet to come out. They've shelved it. And uh, I am working on my first feature in India, but I'm someone who loves um, short films because just the potential they have to go and win the world. That is like, that takes time for feature films. And just, you know, you can, you can shoot a short film in like four days and you can have it traveling in film festival like for two years. Right. So I'm also working on a short and I've recently started working on a documentary series which is called This Also Happens in India. Mm. So it's very interesting subject because, you know, um, we... we there are so many stories in, in the rural India and in, uh, suburbs of India where, you know, so many times we think of, we, we think of things or we hear of things and we say, oh no, it's, it's more of a European thing or it's more of an American thing. And we don't realize that we are human. It could be literally happening next to our society or our, our homes. So what we are doing, we are going out, we are finding these stories which are unique, uh, you know, and we are putting them together in this uh, web series, which is also, which is called This Also Happens in India. And then I, uh, we are starting to shoot like, uh, because it's documentary, don't need like elaborated cast and crew. So we are planning to shoot our first episode in September, which only requires like three people, obviously with social distancing. And uh, uh, meanwhile, I'm also working uh, with uh, a writer based uh, in uh, Mumbai, Rohan, uh, Rohan Roy. Uh, we are like, I spend like almost two hours every day through uh, Skype. We are writing this comedy. It's a rom-com. We are writing this uh, comedy feature film, which also deals with a very serious issue, but we have sugar-coated it with comedy because it, it mm. When it comes to India, it depends. Like you can make an art house film and have it like completely flop, and you can also, uh, you know, spoon feed or serve or uh, put that very serious issue to the audience. You know, just uh, kind of sugarcoated with comedy, and it makes as much uh, serious effect. Or you know, it, 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 it people take that message away just with a little light laughter and i mean it hits same way just so to say so i'm working on that and yeah i'm i, I was supposed to be in india for two years but now uh the the type of work that's coming my way i think i'm going to spend another year and a half or two in india before i move back to l.a which is like my first job. so yeah i'm working on a couple of projects and i've recently formed uh you know a, a film festival here in um, new delhi because I've traveled with my films like to so many film festivals. And when I came down here, I realized that there is not a quality film festival, especially for independent filmmakers. So I was like, let's do it. I'm just like someone who thinks of a thing that, okay, that this is not here or this should be, uh, you know, this should, somebody should do it. I'm like, mm -hmm. why, some, why somebody has to do it? Why not you? So I, I come with that mentality. So yeah, I'm doing a lot of things here in India. Very That's excited fantastic. about that. Uh, Tisharante, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's wonderful work that people like you are doing. Uh, it's wonderful work that we're finally getting to see. And maybe it's a part and parcel, uh, a situation which has been created by COVID-19 that even people like me are being exposed to much more uh, short films, much more quality content on the OTT digital platforms. So thank you so much and all the very best. Kudos to you. Thank you. And kudos for the work that you're doing. Really, really, Thank you really so very much. Impressive. It means a lot.